My name is Julian Podgórski. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Geophysics of Polish Academy of Sciences. And today I want to tell you about Iceland, the land of air and water, as I decided to name this lesson. Let's maybe start with a very short introduction to what Iceland actually is. It is a volcanic island located in the North Atlantic on the tip of the Atlantic Rift. A rift zone at between the two tectonical plates that runs uh, along the whole Atlantic Ocean. It is uh, one of the Nordic countries, which means it's culturally uh, close to places like Denmark or Norway. And, it's, uh, and it isn't a very big island. It mm -hmm. has only 103,000 square kilometers. That's compared to Poland, around as much as one third of, <laughs> of the country, around, around one third of Poland. And on this area, there's only 320,000 people. So that's around one hundred of, of the whole Pol Polish population. So as you can see, it's a r not very large, but still a large-ish country that's populated by very very small population. And here on the two maps you can see uh, the green spot on the globe okay. is where Iceland is in with sure. the Atlantic okay. and the Arctic and uh, the map, map to the right is as you can see the map of Iceland in general and what you can see is uh, you can easily notice are the white, uh, white patches, white spots on this map which are glaciers which will be quite important in our today's lesson. Uh, today we're going to have a sort of uh, trip around the island. So we're going to start at, at the, at the southern or the eastern part of the island and then go uh, westwards and northwards around it to, to see various, various, uh, cultural, various natural and sometimes cultural uh, features Iceland has. And I'll tell you also how, how they were formed. And we will start with the Ice Lagoon, the Jukus Aurlon in Icelandic. And it's a very uh, famous, a feature very famous among tourists. It is a little bay, a little lake, so to say, uh, that's located at the outlet of a glacier. So the situation is of a glacier that you can see in, in the distance on the right picture. It terminates to a lake, into a valley that's filled with water. And it's it's a calving glacier, so uh, pieces of ice are uh, detaching from it, from the front, from the ice cliff, and dropping into the water and floating there, making really a uh, unique, picturesque uh, landscape. On the other side of the lake is a very short river, a channel, so to say, that connects it uh, the the valley with the ocean, and it's a very important one, a very important. Uh, river and channel for this for this bay because it's the very reason why this water is not freezing you would think that um, a small lake a freshwater lake that's uh, produced with uh, glacial melt the water in, in in this lake is glacial melt water uh, filled with ice would freeze Im immediately so as i have mentioned it's a freshwater lake with a lot of ice with within within it we would expect it would freeze over time, but it doesn't. And the reason for it is that this short, narrow channel that I have mentioned on the previous slide is letting some ocean water in. And what ocean water is more saline than fresh water, than glacial melt water. So this even slight increase of salinity in the lake uh, is enough to prevent it from freezing. But it has uh, another um, consequence. That is, if we dam the river, if we cut off the influx of ocean water to the lake, it will all freeze and turn into a large uh, ice ring, so to say. And that's what I actually tried once for, for a movie. I think it was a James Bond movie, where they, the filmmakers needed a, an area of, a large area of ice. So what they did is they put a temporary dam on this little river channel, the whole bay froze, and they could shoot their their icy Arctic scenes on there, 
and afterwards they removed the dam and everything got back to normal with with uh, with the gradually increasing salinity. Additionally, the cold water in the lake is rich in nutrients, so there's a lot of fish, a relatively lot of fish in the area, and it means that seals, various seals that live on Iceland, uh, come often to the to the lake and can be spotted by the tourists. So it's a double, so to say, tourist spot. Not only it's a beautiful lake, but it also has some wildlife to to ad admire. The next stop on our trip is uh, are the black beaches. They are uh, on 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 the first side. They're just like usual beaches we have in in the Baltic Sea or in Mediterranean Sea, but they are black. They are formed of sand that is black, and it's a really um, really specific site of site a fairly characteristic for Iceland. Uh, it is often the black beaches, the black sand is often used as a scene for uh, video clips of Icelandic uh, music bands who want to, if they want to shoot a clip that's uh, supposed to, to be set on, on the moon, for example, or in some fantasy land, there's not, not much more effort than going to, to the black beaches and doing it there. Uh, these beaches are actually sandurs, a geomorphological uh, feature that's formed in front of glaciers. Mm. Those beaches are actually formed in, in, in front of, of the glaciers. And here the little, uh, the little illustration is showing us the, the general scheme of how does it work. And again, a lot of water is involved in formation of sandurs. A glacier, a glacier front that's moving forward, that's flowing onwards and transgressing, is uh, ripping off the underlying rock. And on Iceland, the, the underlying rock is almost always volcanic. That means it's black in color. So there's a lot of black uh, sediment ripped off by uh, by the glaciers, and it uh, it's ripped off in the form of sand or silt or or other such small small grains that are trapped underneath the glaciers very often. And the water underneath the glacier, the subglacial rivers that uh, form when the glacier melts, are carrying away all the sand, uh, carrying away all, all the sand from underneath the glacier. And when the rivers uh, move out into the open, into the um, the, the plains, in front of the glacier, all the sand is gradually dropped from the water and settles down in in the coast of Iceland, forming such such uh, big uh, big black beaches and and plains of black sand. The mechanism is very similar to the sand dunes we know from Europe, from for example from from Poland, from the large uh, large sandy plains of Poland were formed in a very similar fashion, but it, uh, it obviously happens many thousand years ago and uh, without volcanic uh, rock, but different kinds of, of underlying geology. The next thing is the uh, Reykjanes Peninsula. This is this little uh, feature protruding in the west of Iceland. And it's uh, it's located on the American plate already. The previous two things, the previous two features were lying on the Eurasian plate. Reykjanes is uh, in the middle of Atlantic Rift and rather on the American plate side, like the most of Western Iceland. It is a peninsula that formed almost exclusively of of volcanic rocks, volcanic uh, plains that are covered by lichens and moss. This looks in in in, in the close-up, it looks like on the left picture you have some kind of fairly round stones, so to say, made of volcanic rock, and they're covered by all those mosses and lichens. The peninsula is most famous worldwide for the airport. The Keflavik airport is located on this peninsula, as well as a former NATO base, a military former military base was placed in this area. But what interests us more than airports and military bases is the geothermal activity. 
uh, that's related to the location of Iceland on the on the reef itself. On Iceland, uh, the, in, in a land that's uh, relatively young geologically, uh, the crust is very thin. That means that the distance from the surface to, to the stenosphere that's already uh, liquid and very, very, very hot, it's already molten rock, magma, the distance between the hot and, and the surface, the hot, sur hot layer and the surface is very uh, low, so the crust is thin. And the heat that's uh, slowly uh, flowing from from the depth of the earth is can reach the aquifers, the layers of ground that bear groundwater. And this groundwater in aquifers is slowly heated more and more and more, forming uh, geothermal uh, geothermal sources of very hot water located underground. It has two most important consequences. One of them is geysers. When the water in underground uh, is heated as enough to to pass the boiling point and start boiling, a lot of steam is formed in such a um, container with such very hot water. And if there's any kind of channel leading to the surface of the earth, the whole water with the increasing pressure of steam is just thrown away through the channel, forming a geyser that erupts on the surface with very warm, hot water and steam. And the other important uh, consequence of this uh, geothermal water, of this closeness to to astenosphere, is that uh, people can use the hot water as a source of energy. And indeed, on Iceland, almost all the household heating is uh, achieved with use of hot water, with geothermal hot water that's extracted from the earth and uh, uh, used in large power plants to either generate electricity or heat uh, other water that's later sent to to the uh, to the to to the to houses of Icelanders to to heat them. The excess water that's uh, processed through a power plant, a power plant can accept very hot water, even 80 or 90 degrees uh, centigrade hot. After a processing in power plant, it becomes much uh, colder and can be used to fill swimming pools and spas such as, such as Black Lagoon, which uh, also exploits the fact that the geothermal water from, from the depths of the earth is very rich in mineral uh, in mineral ingredients, so it's very healthy for our skin as well. And very close to Reykjavik, some 30 kilometers away lies Reykjavik. It is the capital of Iceland and the biggest city on, on the island. Uh, it's only 120,000 uh, people big. It only has 120,000 inhabitants, so it's uh, not as much as other European capitals. It rather seems to, to European people as a rather small city. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a very modern town, a capital of a modern industrialized uh, country. So uh, it's not missing anything that we would expect from, from, from a European city. They have cinemas, they have uh, museums, uh, concert halls. There's everything we would expect in, in, a, in a European city, and the side of it being quite small, not only by, by population, but also by ter in, in area, uh, we usually wouldn't even notice that we are so far in the north in, in a so seemingly uh, ho inhospitable place. But there is one thing that uh, is uh, very distinct from other places, and that can sometimes get uh, mm, problematic maybe, and that's winter in Reykjavik. On Iceland, winters can become very harsh. Uh, there is this, uh, a lot of snow can fall in very short time in, in, in a blizzard or in a snowstorm. And uh, the snowstorm or, or even the strong winds that are coming from the ocean can become so strong that they cut off the city from the rest of the, uh, of the island. Uh, it can happen. It can so happen that a sudden uh, storm can can cause so extreme weather, so to say, so strong wind that even big trucks can be blown out of the way outside the city, 
and in such cases the authorities are sometimes forced to close the, the roads leading to the city so that nothing uh, dangerous happens there and the only ways of getting to to the city then is uh, is by by a, by a ship by a boat because even even airplanes can't can't land very uh, can't land reliably with such strong weather but aside of that when a lot of snow falls in Reykjavik it like on this upper picture on the upper photograph it it starts looking like a Santa Claus village a very um good uh, topic for today close to the christmas so even in this uh, harshest uh, winter months in uh, in, december, in the end of december the middle of december it's still a quite pleasant place to live especially with, with the people of Reykjavik that are that are rather friendly and the other thing in winter that can get uh, um can be troubling for many is the darkness iceland lies just below the arctic circle and it means uh, in although in summer it's it, the days are very very long in winter the days are very very short and in december it can happen so that there's only three or four hours of sunlight every day and on top of that iceland is famous for its cloudiness so very quite often it happens that even though the sun rises over horizon for a few hours you won't see anything of it because there are cloud cover is so thick over Reykjavik. The next stop on our trip after a short rest in the city is Thingvelli. It's a tectonic valley located in the middle of the Atlantic Rift, it's so to say the center of of it. And it's significant not only geologically, which we will um, discuss on the next slide as well, but for many many years it was a meeting area of the Icelandic Parliament. When the Viking settlers came to Iceland, they brought with themselves a culture of uh, the very early form of parliamentarism. And they uh, chose this valley, this large beautiful valley, as the meeting spot of the parliament where they discussed things like courts of justice or law or, or things like that necessary for a society to function. But what's interesting for us is that it's uh, Thingvelli is the place we, where we can see the two tectonic plates, the Eurasian in the east and American in the west, uh, working almost with our own eyes. The processes of, of, of the two plates spreading away, moving away from each other is obviously very slow, but it is, uh, it is proven that it, it happens. And the reason for it is the upwards movement of magma in the lower, deeper, uh, hotter parts of of the Earth, the same that gives Iceland its uh, hot water. Uh, and with uh, with the gradual uh, spread of the two uh, two plates, with the gradual movement uh, away from each another, new rocks are formed inside between them, just like on this diagram where you can see that gradually the layer after layer young rock is built uh, is built up between the two plates as they move away from each other and the valley in which this build up takes place for thousands of years is where the Icelanders uh, put their their parliaments as you can see with this little flag The next spot is quite a, quite a different place, just like Thingvelli was, so to say, in the center of the volcanic, of the tectonic activity of Iceland. The West Fjords, the West Fjordvig in, in Icelandic, is the oldest and the geologically part of the island. It's the part of the country that was formed as the earliest, and it is so old that any volcanic activity has already cooled down. Is the place where you won't find volcanoes or spreading uh, tectonical plates, and also no geothermal activity. The crust became thick enough here, and old and thick enough to to prevent such uh, events like in Reykjanes Peninsula to happen. So geologically, it's a very uh, very calm country, but because it's so old, 
it allowed for formation of fjords, like the one you can see on this picture. What you can see here is a very classical example of a fjord, one of the many, as you can see on the map, on the red piece that shows that every single of those fingers, so to say, is, is a piece of a fjord. And let's now wonder for a while how fjords or glacial valleys in general are being formed. It takes a lot of time to build a fjord and it takes several uh, glaciations. It starts with a little scratch, so to say, in relief. Let's uh, imagine a fairly flat rocky surface which have a little valley, a very small maybe river valley uh, carved within, within it. And suddenly a glacier comes, a glacier appears in the area and uh, starts uh, eroding the ground. The erosion of uh, strength of erosion beneath the glacier is dependent on the depth of the ice, the thickness of the ice. So in a place where glacier where the ice is thicker, for example over a glacial valley, a river valley, the erosion will be stronger and the uh, valley will become deeper. While the areas surrounding the valley will not be eroded as much or maybe even not at all, which um, will mean uh, that they stay on the same level while the valley becomes stronger. The same uh, scheme is repeating uh, in each subse subse subsequent glaciation, but at the each next uh, iteration, so to say, the valley is a little bit deeper. So as you can see on the second, uh, second block of the diagram below, the small the, the glacier is eroding more or less similarly but in the scratch it's eroding a bit more then the glacier melts another glaciation comes in after an interglacial period and the new valley is already deeper so the difference in erosion is even stronger and the deepening is even more pronounced and so it goes in the third and fourth and fifth and however many glaciations can come to an area, the valley is getting strong, deeper and deeper, and it takes shape, ultimately it takes shape of a U-shaped valley. A glacier is shaping a valley that has a shape of U in cross-section, as you can see on this picture, which has a, the valley has very gentle slopes in, in the bottom, and really, uh, really, really um, steep ones. Uh, at the top. At the top it's almost almost a vertical rock wall, while in the bottom it's fairly nice and gentle. And today, after all the glaciations have uh, moved uh, moved on and moved away from the island, uh, the, some of those valleys become covered, become dry, drowned in water, so we don't really see this U-shape as well as in a non, not drowned glacial valley, but here you can see the, the final stage of fjord formation, submerging it by the sea. This image in the bottom is the same we can have on the last block of the diagram here. And the next one, another, um, another feature uh, related to lava and water, is the Mubakir. It's a city of rocks, so to say, a, an, a, an area covered with uh, with rock formation, with volcanic rock formation that look similar to towers or castles or houses. So they were named by Icelanders dark castles. That's what the Dimmubakir means in Icelandic. And they are located again in the area of active volcanism or in the area of, of the Atlantic Rift where volcanoes are active and alive. And they are very interesting and rare uh, features. So let's uh, take a look at how they were formed again. During a volcanic eruption many, many years ago, many hundreds of years ago, um, lava, flowing lava that uh, was erupted from a volcano, uh, flowed over marshes, over some kind of wetland, an area that has a lot of water in the ground. The flowing lava, as we know, is very, very hot. As we saw, it's hot enough to make water boil. And indeed, once a layer of hot lava covered water logged ground, the water in the ground has started boiling, and columns of steam formed, 
and uh, exploded into this liquid lava. But column of steam, steam, even though it's 100 degrees uh, centigrade hot, is very hot for us, it's uh, really cold when compared to lava, which is several hundred uh, centigrade, uh, degrees centigrade hot. So around those uh, pillars, those explosions of steam that appeared underneath the lava, the lava solidified and created a kind of uh, shell around this cold, so to say, steam. But it didn't take the whole of the lava to, it didn't cool all the lava, only little parts of it. So when the liquid part that remained uh, flowed away, it left those shells, those empty hollow columns and towers that were formed by, by steam underneath cold lava, hot lava, excuse me. Uh, during the years, uh, over the years of erosion, uh, those uh, hollow those hollow forms uh, collapsed, the holes appeared in them, and they started looking like that, like ruined houses, because that's how how, how they look like when when a hollow thing collapses. It's almost like if, if a house uh, was, if, if a roof was removed from a house, that's why it looks like a castle, and it's a very interesting feature. And the last uh, stop on our trip around Iceland is the Tifus. It's a waterfall, uh, because, oh, I didn't mention yet, the waterfalls are very popular and very common on Iceland. There's a lot of waterfalls there. And this one, Detifoss, in the north of Iceland, is the mightiest, if we look by this church, waterfall in Iceland. It's also a very high and very um, magnificent uh, feature of terrain. And it's uh, located on a river that's flowing from beneath the largest ice cap, the largest glacier on Iceland, the Vatnajökull. And as we can see on the on the left image, it's uh, the, the river that flows from the waterfall is located in a very deep uh, valley, formed obviously of volcanic rocks. And uh, what can be interesting in this case is that this very deep valley with very high walls can sometimes be filled with water in its entirety. The water can even overflow over those rock uh, those rock walls as evidenced by the terrace that forms over over it. You can see that thick thick uh, thick black wall going up from the river, then there's a little bit of a plain and another wall going up serving as an evidence that yes, the whole of this area can be filled with water, but it takes a really, really huge amount of water to fill this this tall valley, but indeed it can happen, and the phenomenon is called Jökulhlaup. It's a, a an Icelandic word meaning glacial flood uh, that went into glaciological terminology worldwide, and it's related. It's a, it's used to to describe a, a kind of very sudden flash flood, so to say, that's related to volcanoes and glaciers. Uh, Vatna Yoku's ice cap is so big that it can, that there are uh, volcanoes beneath it, and those volcanoes are usually calm. A calm volcano is uh, just like a, a, a reservoir of magma, of lava underground. It, uh, it's radiating some heat from the inside, just like the ones with uh, in Reykjanes with geothermy, the heat is slowly heating the glacier, the ice melts very slowly, flows down a channel, and the calm river is forming, just like on the left picture on this slide. A very calm river is flowing, is getting to a, a precipice in, in the terrain, a waterfall forms, the river flows on, and nothing dangerous is really happening there. But sometimes a volcano underneath a glacier can erupt, uh, spewing away, spewing up a lot of lava into this cold glacier. This sudden influx of very hot lava causes very sudden melting of water in the glacier. And this water has to drain somewhere, it has to go somewhere. So it goes with the same channels that the calm river usually flows. And it means a very sudden and very uh, drastic increase of discharge, which actually obviously means sudden flood. 
And that's the case on the right uh, picture of the diagram, where a lot of water is suddenly released from underneath the glacier, and the whole valley can be actually drained because the, the drowned, excuse me, because uh, the whole valley underneath the the waterfall, because the amount of water is so huge, and it's not only um, not only an extreme extreme hydrological event, it also can can become dangerous for the people, for humans who live in river valleys, especially for bridges and uh, roads. It's, it happens sometimes that uh, bridges and uh, and uh, streets on that pass over such rivers, such glacial rivers, can be just washed away by, by a sudden local cloud. And that's uh, that's the lesson for today.